Rwanda was in the midst of one of the worst genocides in African history in 1994. 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus perished in 100 days as a result of a government-sponsored massacre and extermination. A further 30% of Rwanda's population had fled from the violence due to the violence. There was only a 21.9-year life expectancy in the country. There was a complete collapse of its economy, destruction of its infrastructure, and a massive loss of life. There was no longer any semblance of a social fabric. Rwanda was once considered a failed state in every aspect imaginable and was described as the closest thing to a living hell. The area north of Lake Kivu is especially striking, as one side of the border is home to slums lacking running water and electricity, plagued by violent crime and poverty, and constantly under threat from heavily armed rebel groups. It is common for individuals to pay bribes to enter and leave the country. However, just a few meters across the border to the east, the situation is remarkably different. The streets are not all paved, but they are incredibly clean, drivers adhere to speed limits, and the police do not solicit bribes. The city has a vibrant economy, which is evident in the well-built homes, and healthcare is both affordable and accessible. The homicide rate in this area is even lower than that in the United States. It may come as a surprise that the thriving area previously described is actually located in Rwanda. Despite the country's lack of significant natural resources and being the most land-scarce nation in Africa, Rwanda has undergone an incredible transformation over the past 30 years. This transformation is evident through improvements in life expectancy, infant mortality, GDP per capita, reduction in violent crime and poverty rates, and increased educational enrollment rates. These improvements are in stark contrast to neighboring countries that have remained stagnant or even regressed. The question is, how did Rwanda achieve such remarkable progress in such a short time? And is the ongoing economic growth sustainable? If someone has a second apartment that they are not using, renting it out can be a simple way to earn additional income. In the year 2022, it is important to diversify one's investments as solely relying on stocks may not yield favorable results, especially with predictions that the stock market may remain stagnant. Furthermore, with inflation causing a loss of 9% of funds in bank accounts, people are actively seeking alternative investment options. Learning from the strategies of successful investors, a recent study by Ernst & Young showed that 80% of ultra-high net worth individuals choose to invest in alternative options. Bank of America's chief investment officer, CIO, recommends investing in fine art as an alternative option to combat inflation. Real estate, gold, and private equity are some of the other alternative options that people invest in, but the CIO believes that art may be a high-performing alternative that can protect one's cash. According to UBS, two-thirds of millionaires already hedge against inflation with art. In fact, during the last period of high inflation, art appreciation saw an unprecedented increase of 33.2% annually. Masterworks provides an easy way to diversify one's portfolio with paintings from renowned artists such as Picasso and Banksy with just a few clicks. What's even better is that investing in fine art through Masterworks doesn't require millions of dollars. In fact, Masterworks has consistently delivered impressive net returns of 25% for the past four years, despite challenges such as COVID, a bear market, and high inflation. It's worth noting that the original inhabitants of the African Great Lakes region were the Hutu people, with the TWA people being present to a lesser extent. While there is ongoing debate surrounding the topic, it is believed that in the 1500s, the Tutsi people migrated to the African Great Lakes region from the Horn of Africa. Over time, the Tutsis and their cattle became dominant through military and economic means, eventually establishing a highly centralized and militarized kingdom in the 1700s. Despite only making up 15% of the population, the Tutsis accumulated a vast majority of the wealth, power, and resources. The kingdom was later colonized by the Germans and then the Belgians after World War I. To avoid the expense of direct rule over the colony, the Belgians formed an alliance with the Tutsi-dominated power structure, allowing the Tutsis to maintain their privileged position in society in exchange for resources from the Hutus that were funneled to the Belgians. The Belgian colonial rulers exacerbated the power differences between the Hutus, Tutsis, 
and TWA by forcing the population to carry identification cards marked with their ethnic group. The Tutsis, who made up a minority of the population, were privileged and received resources from the Hutus in exchange for maintaining their position. The Hutus, on the other hand, faced heavy taxes and forced unpaid labor. The Belgians introduced coffee to the region to make the colony more profitable, but this only further oppressed the Hutus. As a result, resentment grew among the Hutus towards the Tutsis' privileged position. However, this power structure didn't last long. Due to their fear of a potential Hutu rebellion, which could be fueled by their significantly larger population, the Belgians began to shift their favor towards the Hutu majority. This transition, combined with the death of the king and the long-standing oppression experienced by the Tutsi, created a favorable environment for the emergence of extensive anti-Tutsi violence. The first wave of this violence occurred in 1959, leading to the displacement of approximately 150,000 Tutsis from Rwanda into neighboring nations. The Hutu power, combined with anti-colonial feelings, eventually led to Rwanda gaining independence in 1962. Following the Hutus' takeover, they flipped the system and established discriminatory practices against the Tutsis. These acts sometimes included organized acts of violence against them, and as a result, millions of Tutsi refugees left the country over the years. Despite these challenges, Rwanda managed to maintain steady economic growth, thanks in part to external aid, advantageous trade agreements, and a significant increase in global coffee prices. As Rwanda experienced economic growth, its population also grew rapidly. The country was already the most densely populated in Africa, and this posed a significant challenge as land became increasingly scarce. This was especially problematic as most of the population relied on the crops they grew on their own small plots of land for sustenance. Unfortunately, like many countries that rely heavily on a single export, the plummeting coffee prices in the late 1980s had a devastating impact on the Rwandan economy, causing shockwaves throughout the nation. The situation in Rwanda was further exacerbated by the deterioration of the agricultural land, which was overcultivated and showing signs of heavy wear and tear. Adding to this was a significant drought that struck the country in 1988 and 1989. With too many people to feed and unproductive farmlands, the government lacked the resources to intervene and help the situation. Furthermore, the government had become increasingly authoritarian, corrupt, and ineffective as a totalitarian one-party state. In an attempt to deflect blame from themselves and their mounting issues, the government began using the Tutsis as scapegoats. Paul Kagame, the former president of Rwanda, had a traumatic experience as a child when he and his family narrowly escaped death during one of the many outbreaks of violence against the Tutsis. Fortunately, they managed to flee Rwanda and seek refuge in southern Uganda, where they joined hundreds of thousands of other refugees. This was one of Kagame's earliest memories and likely had a significant impact on his life and political career. During his time in southern Uganda, Kagame joined the military and quickly rose through the ranks, eventually becoming a senior officer. He then played a key role in helping to overthrow the Ugandan government in a military coup. After this, he joined the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, a militant global network made up of Tutsi refugees who aimed to return to their homeland. Eventually, Kagame would become the leader of the RPF, and his military experience would prove to be valuable as he led the group's efforts to take control of Rwanda. The RPF was a well-organized, efficient, and battle-hardened fighting force. With the situation in Rwanda continuing to deteriorate and ongoing human rights abuses against the Tutsis, the RPF saw an opportunity and launched their plans to invade Rwanda in October 1990. Despite an initially successful invasion, a prolonged stalemate led to a fragile peace settlement in 1993. However, this peace was short-lived, as in April 1994, the president of Rwanda was assassinated when his private jet was shot down. This event marked the beginning of a horrific genocide that can only be described as hell on earth. In the years leading up to the genocide, the Rwandan government had secretly armed militant groups and identified all Tutsi households, while vicious anti-Tutsi propaganda had become increasingly prevalent. The government had been planning the extermination of the Tutsi population, and the downing of the president's plane was the catalyst for the genocide to begin. 
Over the next 100 days, around 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus were brutally murdered. Kagame and the RPF immediately resumed their fighting, and the killings did not stop until they captured the capital city of Kigali. When the RPF finally gained control of Rwanda, the country was in a dire state. The majority of Tutsis, around 77 percent, had been killed, leaving those who remained deeply traumatized. Millions of Hutus had also fled, fearing retaliation from the RPF. In total, Rwanda had lost around a third of its population. The infrastructure was almost entirely destroyed, and the economy was producing very little. The deep-seated social resentment between the Hutus and Tutsis remained, and the international community regarded Rwanda as an irreparable failed state. The question remained of how to rebuild a country that had been so devastated. After gaining control of Rwanda, the RPF immediately took three actions. The first was to establish a temporary government led by RPF leaders. The new government was modeled after the RPF fighting force, with a focus on transparency, efficiency, and anti-corruption measures. Its goal was to stabilize the country, address past wrongs, unify the people, and create a society free of ethnic divisions. The second objective was to use the military as a police force to prevent further violence and to capture as many perpetrators of the genocide as possible. By the end of the operation, 120,000 people had been imprisoned in a country of 6 million. After the genocide, Rwanda faced the challenge of bringing the perpetrators to justice. With the number of prisoners exceeding the capacity of the justice system, the country had to rely on traditional community-based Kakaka courts to expedite trials. Although the fairness of the proceedings is unknown, the system allowed the country to process a significant number of cases. Meanwhile, the international community, which had neglected Rwanda during the genocide, now had a responsibility to help the country rebuild. Despite the lack of political will from the United Nations due to previous failures, Rwanda had to accept help to overcome its tremendous challenges. Following the genocide, many countries and international organizations felt guilty for failing to intervene and began to provide Rwanda with significant amounts of humanitarian aid. In the first year after the conflict, about $700 million were sent to the country. The aid helped rebuild infrastructure, restore healthcare facilities, and reopen schools. Although still struggling, Rwanda's situation began to stabilize and gradually improve by the year 2000. Paul Kagame, despite claiming he had no intention of becoming a politician, eventually assumed the role of vice president in the temporary government after the RPF took control of Rwanda. He also became the leader of the National Army. Kagame later took over the presidency in 2000 after then-President Bizimungu resigned following a disagreement with the RPF. Around the same time, Rwanda developed its Vision 2020, a plan to rapidly develop and become a middle-income country within two decades. The Vision 2020 focused on six key priorities, good governance, international integration, private sector development, infrastructure, human resources, and agriculture. In order to prevent another outbreak of violence, Rwanda's government has prioritized stability over democracy. The constitution established in 2003, with Kagame as the first elected president, effectively turned Rwanda into a one-party state. Opposition parties are banned from participating in elections and political opponents are often jailed or even killed. Freedom of speech has been limited and democratic principles have not been fully established. Despite not being an absolute dictatorship, Rwanda has been largely controlled by the Tutsi minority since 1994. Given Rwanda's history and unique situation, its leadership recognized that building and maintaining political legitimacy required ensuring security, promoting rapid economic growth, and suppressing any opposition. To achieve these goals, Kagame and the RPF worked to establish a transparent and effective governance system that could facilitate rapid economic development. As a result, Rwanda has become one of the least corrupt nations in Africa and has achieved impressive economic growth rates. While questions remain about the suppression of political opposition and free speech, the success of Rwanda's economic development has been widely recognized. In comparison to its neighbors, Rwanda's low corruption rate has given it a significant advantage, though the country is not without flaws. However, 
This advantage has created a positive feedback loop when it comes to foreign aid. Rwanda is able to effectively use the aid it receives, leading to an increased willingness by nations to continue supplying it. This has allowed for Rwanda's economic growth and development, which is often referred to as the Rwandan economic miracle. Rwanda, lacking substantial natural resources, decided to invest in its most valuable resource, its people. Kagame recognized the need for significant improvements in healthcare, as the average life expectancy was just 47.2 years when he took office, and access to healthcare was limited and of poor quality. In order to improve the productivity of the workforce and overall well being of the population, Kagame focused on improving the healthcare system in Rwanda. With a large percentage of aid allocated to healthcare, modern hospitals and local clinics have been built throughout the country. To address the shortage of medical personnel, extensive funding and training programs were implemented to attract and retain doctors and nurses, both domestic and foreign. To ensure universal access to medical coverage, all Rwandans are eligible for full insurance coverage at a cost of just $2 a day. Those who cannot afford this fee receive free medical services. Rwanda has also made significant investments in improving its education system. It has allocated a large portion of its budget, about 30%, to education, making it the government's biggest expenditure. The country has placed a heavy emphasis on teacher training and building new schools with the help of humanitarian organizations. Rwanda has also made 12 years of education mandatory to ensure that all children receive a basic education. These efforts have led to significant improvements in the education system, allowing more children to attend school and receive a higher quality education. Rwanda's success is attributed to several factors, and one of the key contributors is its police force. However, it was not always efficient and trusted. Major reforms were implemented to transform it into one of the strongest institutions in the country. The police force played a crucial role in maintaining stability and security after the genocide, and today it continues to uphold law and order while ensuring the safety of the people. The reforms included comprehensive training, proper equipment, and increasing the number of female officers. The police force is also responsible for community policing, promoting public trust and engagement, and addressing social issues such as gender-based violence and child abuse. The police force in Rwanda underwent major reforms to improve its efficiency and gain the trust of the community. The training for officers was increased, and human rights were made a priority. Additionally, the police force was subjected to external oversight by seven different governmental and civilian committees. Further reforms encouraged collaboration between the police and the community, with police regularly communicating their objectives and setting up anonymous phone lines for crime reporting. These efforts have resulted in Rwanda having some of the lowest crime rates in Africa, and a 2018 Gallup poll ranks Rwanda second in Africa for law and order. The government of Rwanda utilized the improved safety and access to healthcare and education as a basis to implement policies aimed at boosting the country's economy. One of the main strategies employed was to prioritize the development of infrastructure. This included building road networks to enhance connectivity throughout the country, constructing large hydropower plants to provide electricity to households and industries, and investing in Kigali Airport. Given Rwanda's landlocked status, it was vital to enhance its connectivity to the rest of the world through air travel and cargo shipments. Rwanda's government made substantial investments in telecommunications infrastructure with a $95 million budget to build a 2,300-kilometer network, which enabled Rwanda to rank third in Africa for internet connectivity. The transportation infrastructure development has led to a significant decrease in transportation costs, making exports more competitive, and resulted in improving profits and wages for those working in agriculture, which is the primary sector for the poorest population. In parallel, the government made a concerted effort to transform the productivity of the agricultural sector. Rwanda has been fortunate with the rise in prices of its primary export, coffee, since 2001. However, it recognizes that relying on one industry for economic growth is not sustainable in the long run. Therefore, the government has made significant strides in attracting foreign investment to diversify its economy and tap into more profitable markets. To achieve this, 
Rwanda has reduced tariffs on exports and taxes, simplified the process of starting and operating a business, removed unnecessary regulations, and strengthened laws related to enforcing business contracts. These measures have made Rwanda more appealing to investors and have helped to spur economic growth. Rwanda's efforts to improve its business environment have been successful, leading to a significant increase in foreign investment and growth across all sectors. The country's reforms resulted in Rwanda being named the most improved nation in the world in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index, moving up from 142nd place in 2008 to 29th in 2019. This has attracted a large amount of foreign investment, rising from $8 million in 2005 to $366 million in 2018. The increase in foreign investment, combined with the growing safety of the country, has contributed to significant growth in all sectors, especially in tourism, which is now the primary source of foreign capital. Rwanda's tourism revenue has increased from $27 million in 2000 to $635 million in 2019. Rwanda's service sector, which includes tourism, banking, retail, hotels, transportation, communication, and other basic services, has been experiencing rapid growth, diversifying the economy and creating higher-paying jobs. However, one of the most controversial aspects of Rwanda's economic development has been the creation of state-owned enterprises. Crystal Ventures, which is owned by the ruling party RPF, has a significant presence in the economy with investments in various sectors such as telecommunications, milk processing, road construction, high-end coffee shops, and luxury real estate. Rwanda has established state-owned enterprises such as Crystal Ventures and Horizon, which have a significant impact on the economy. While some argue that these companies facilitate investments into long-term projects and break through markets that private sectors and foreign investors avoid, others criticize the intersection of commercial and political power. These state-owned enterprises have successfully established ventures such as a mobile phone network, but there are concerns about the timing of the transition to the private sector. While they sometimes lose contracts to private competitors, the challenge lies in striking the right balance between commercial and political interests. The establishment of large holding companies has been helpful in creating businesses where there previously were none. However, there are concerns that these conglomerates are becoming less effective and potentially politically risky. Despite this, they have played a significant role in Rwanda's development thus far. Rwanda's focus on developing its human capital, investing in infrastructure, and attracting foreign investment has yielded remarkable results. The country's GDP has grown at an average rate of over 8% since 2000, resulting in a five-fold increase in total economic output and making it one of the fastest-growing economies in the world. Rwanda has made significant progress in improving the well-being of its citizens. The population is healthier, wealthier, and more educated than ever before. The nation has overcome food insecurity and reduced crime and violence. However, there are still challenges to be addressed. Despite the impressive economic growth, the majority of Rwandans still rely on subsistence agriculture and economic opportunities remain limited. Furthermore, there are concerns that the government may have inflated its achievements and there have been allegations of illegal resource extraction from neighboring countries like Congo. Rwanda's economic success has been accompanied by potential risks and concerns. President Kagame's authoritarian style of governance, which was deemed necessary to rebuild the country after the genocide, is now posing a risk to its future. Ethnic tension is still present and the government's suppression of free speech and political freedom may exacerbate this issue. While the government has provided security and rapid development, many Rwandans have accepted the lack of political freedom over the past two decades. Rwanda's rapid economic growth has come at a cost, as the government's authoritarian rule and suppression of political freedom and free speech risk ethnic tensions and potential violence in the future. Despite the government's success in providing security and rapid development, there are concerns that without a smooth transition of power, the elite could continue to benefit at the expense of the people. While Rwanda is on track to become a middle-income country by 2035 and potentially a rich country by 2050, the true test of its progress will be how it manages its political future and ensures the prosperity of all its citizens. Stories, 
with its impressive economic growth and improved living standards for its citizens. However, there are also concerns about the country's political future and the potential risks of a one-party state. There is a fear that if a less benevolent leader were to come into power, it could lead to violence and instability. To ensure continued stability and progress, Rwanda's government should consider shifting toward a more democratic style of governance, similar to Botswana. This would help ensure that the interests of the people are being represented and that the elite are not enriching themselves at the expense of the population. However, given the current government's reluctance to relinquish power, it remains to be seen whether this will happen. For now, Rwanda remains one of Africa's success stories, but the future is uncertain. As we continue to learn about Africa, let's not forget about the challenges it still faces. We've seen Rwanda's incredible transformation, but we must also acknowledge that there is still work to be done. Poverty, corruption, and political instability still plague many African nations. So let's use our platform to spread awareness and advocate for positive change. Let's support organizations that are working to improve the lives of people in Africa. Let's encourage our leaders to invest in the continent and address issues like inequality, education, and healthcare. Together, we can help Africa realize its full potential and create a brighter future for all its citizens. Let's keep the conversation going and stay informed. Thank you for watching and let's make a difference.